I did arrive a couple of days late because my beloved Bristol City were, of course, here at the weekend. We managed the feat of losing to Sheffield Wednesday, um, which not many teams have managed this season, apparently. Um, although Wednesday are probably doing slightly better than United at the moment, but uh, we won't mention that. But there you go. I don't want to get into a kind of, you know, civil war here in Sheffield. It's not what I want to do. But um, and it's a real, real delight to be uh, here. I've been uh, in this cathedral a number of times before and uh, known Sophie for many years. And, and Pete uh, as well has been a good friend for many years. And it's been uh, a real delight to share with you uh, both last night and then again um, today. Um, I want to start with a question. What would it take to bring about a renewal of faith, of Christian faith in this nation? If there was one thing that we would need to do as a church that would spark off a renewal of Christian faith, what would that be? And I guess today I want to argue that there is one thing I think that is maybe, among other things, really crucial in that prospect of a renewal of Christian faith. But I want to do it by means of, let me get the um, um, title here, by starting out by thinking about how, how we as a church are position ourselves in relationship to a secular culture around us. Now, there are a number of different ways in which we might do this, and here are a number of models as to how that might work. Um, so, if we think about church in a secular society, one way in which we might think of the way in which we are to kind of posture ourselves and relate to a, a, a society around us is the model of what we might call transformation. Um, so I keep, I keep turning around to see whether I've got the thing right there, there over there. Um, now, you see this on many church websites. You go on a website and it says, our purpose is to change the world. Our purpose is to redeem the culture. Our purpose is to transform society. Is that the way in which we are to engage? Is that our purpose within the world, to change the world in that kind of language? That's one option. Second option would be what we might call apologetics. In other words, our task towards a secular culture is to mount and present all kinds of rational arguments as to why people should believe in God, why God exists, why the resurrection happened, why Jesus is the true son of God, and so on. Is that the way in which we are to engage with a secular society? The third option would be that of what we might call withdrawal. A number of years ago, a book came out by an American author called Rod Dreher. You may have come across it called The Benedict Option, which eventually was arguing that in a deeply secular society, the only option for the church is to be like withdraw, to offer a countercultural alternative to the wider society. Well, then, fourthly, the last one might be simply to put our energies into growth. Is our relationship with a wider society to focus on growing big churches? Now, I want to suggest there's an element of wisdom in all of those. I don't want to, kind of, uh, to, to, to rubbish any of them. But I think there is, I want to argue, for a fifth option. And that is that if I, if you're, if one, if I were to say one thing that I think we need to do more than anything else at the moment, it is to focus our energies on witness. That this category of witness is the posture that we take towards a secular society is, I think, the right one to take. And in today's talk in this morning, I wanted to divide it into two halves. So the first half is really thinking about uh, why witness is the way in which we are to engage with a wider society. The second half is what kind of witness do we need to offer? So here's my first half. Why is witness the right way to think about our engagement with wider society. Number one, because I would argue it fits the time. It fits the time in which we are placed. Um, we thought about apologetics as one of the ways in which we might address a secular society. And I guess over the last 10, 20 years, while the new atheism has been quite, it's quite dominant in our society, uh, a lot of energy has been put into kind of countering the arguments of the new atheists. But at the same time, one of the aspects of our contemporary society is a certain skepticism about truth. Now, again, there are two parts to this. One part of it is that deeply postmodern sense that there is no such thing as ultimate truth, and that truth claims are really claims to power. In other words, if you say, I have the truth and you don't, 
I am right and you are wrong. What you're really doing is you are imposing your vision of reality upon someone else. Because there are just many truths out there. There was no adjudication between them. There's no ultimate truth to be found. There are only truths, the different truths of different communities or of different people. And therefore claims to truth are always only a, an, a, an exercise of power. That's one aspect of the skepticism about truth. The second aspect of the skepticism about truth is the whole post-truth age. Uh, Post-truth is something we perhaps associate with figures like Donald Trump or perhaps even Boris Johnson, uh, public figures who were relatively cavalier about the truth. But it's also a wider cultural phenomenon in the fact that we now live in a world which is bombarded with information. When you wake up in the morning and you open up your BBC website or whatever website you look at, the internet is just awash with different opinions and ideas and presentations of things that claim to be truth. We're very aware, there's been a report on it in the last few days about deep fake. Now the idea of um, being able to use artificial intelligence to take any public figure and a bit of video and match that person's voice to any bit of speech you want. I saw one the other day about Donald Trump arguing that the Scottish try against France really was true and that he invented rugby and everything else that was true about sort of that. You can kind of make anyone say anything now with the use of artificial intelligence, and it's not true. So we live in a post-truth age where actually it's quite a hard to discern the truth. How on earth are you to tell what is true when there is so much information, so much data coming at you at any moment? And in that world where there is this skepticism about truth, then claims to truth are always going to be suspect. And therefore, if our position towards a secular society is to say somehow that we can demonstrate the truth of what we believe, we're always, I think, going to struggle. Second thing about this particular moment is what I might call a repositioned church. And this is the reality that we as the church, and even the Church of England, we don't have the social capital that we once had to sway culture. Now again, as I was saying a moment ago, sometimes we talk very boldly about changing the culture, advancing the kingdom, redeeming the culture, changing the world. And yet when you think about our position within society and our much diminished position, how realistic are we being when we talk in that kind of language? There's a book by James Davison Hunter, an American academic, called To Change the World, which is written from the American experience, but it still has some resonances with us here. And uh, his conclusion is this, and you may agree with it, you may disagree with it, but let's just um, explain it. He says, uh, it is essential for us to abandon altogether talk of redeeming the culture, advancing the kingdom, transforming the world. Christian needs, Christians need to leave such language behind them because it carries too much weight. It implies conquest takeover, or dominion, which is precisely what God does not call us to pursue, at least not in any conventional 20th or 21st century way of understanding these terms. And maybe our diminished status within our society actually is drawing us back to a more authentic engagement with our society. Maybe we were never meant to be the dominant player. Maybe we were never meant to rule over the world. Maybe bishops were not meant to be princes running armies and telling everybody what to do. And maybe the loss of our power takes us back to our original calling, not to bear and wield power in the world, not to bear, bear power, but to bear witness. This, of course, is a journey that Old Testament Israel went through as they went into exile and they learned to sing the Lord's song in a foreign land. That may be much more true to our cultural moment than wielding power within our society. Third reason why in this cultural moment witness really matters, because of the power of story. Again, claiming to have and to tell and to demonstrate the truth is one thing. It's probably not going to gain much of a hearing. But telling a story is different. Now we've heard something of the power of stories recently. The post office scandal is a story that's been rumbling around for 15, 20 years or so, but no one really took much notice of it until 
The filmmakers told the story. We all watched the documentary. We all watched that little series. And suddenly everybody was up in arms about the, post, the, the sub postmasters and this injustice that had happened to them. The telling of a story was powerful in capturing the imagination of people. And so maybe telling stories, telling the story of Christian faith, the story of what Christ has done in your life, in your community, in your place, that has a much more powerful impact than claiming to tell the truth. Now, it doesn't say that we don't tell the truth, but maybe the means by which we tell the truth is telling a story, bearing witness, and saying, this is what I've seen, this is what I've experienced. You can disagree with someone who's telling you, who's telling you that they have the truth. It's quite hard to disagree with someone's story. <coughs> then, lastly, I think one of the uh, key things about our, our time is that we are perhaps in a new moment. Maybe 10 years ago, the dominant voices in about religion in public life were those voices of Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Sam Harris, you know, the new atheists. And Christians were very much on the back foot when it came to defending the faith. The voices you hear in public nowadays about Christian faith are very different. It's the voices of people like Tom Holland and Jordan Peterson and Paul Kingsnorth and Douglas Murray, who either have embraced Christian faith or speak very positively about Christian faith and its impact on Western culture. There's something has shifted in our time. And if that's true, then maybe now is not the moment to withdraw. Now is the moment for a more confident witness to Jesus Christ. So there's my first reason why witness really matters, because of the moment we happen to be in. Second reason why I think um, witness matters to us is because Jesus told us to. Um, I know this, there's something about um, uh, the way Jesus speaks uh, about what it means to follow him. I don't know if you've noticed this. I was noticing it recently. Um, Jesus says things like this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Again, he says this, you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. This is discipleship, to take up your cross, to join a procession that is leading towards execution. The assumption that persecution is part of the normal Christian experience. Now, of course, the early Christians grasped this as well. St. Paul had it also. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. There's a little book by the Roman Catholic uh, theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar called The Moment of Christian Witness. And in this book, which is about Christian witness, he says this, and it was a phrase that really struck me when I read it some while ago. Persecution constitutes the normal condition of the church in her relation to the world. And martyrdom is the normal condition of the professed Christian. I just let that sink in for a moment. Persecution constitutes the normal condition of the church in relation to the world. And martyrdom is the normal condition of the professed Christian. We know about the martyrs. We read their stories. They're even contemporary martyrs. And we think they're the abnormal ones. We're the normal ones who live, we bumble along quite happily with our neighbors, fairly well tolerated within our societies. And what Jesus, St. Paul, and first von Balthasar are saying, actually, it's the other way around. The normal Christian life is persecution and martyrdom, and being gently tolerated like we are is the, abs is the abnormal Christian life. Now, the early Christians were very keen on the martyrs. They used to gather in the tombs of the martyrs to pray. The tombs of the martyrs were holy places. In the Te Deum, we sing about the white-robed army of martyrs who praise you. Now, why were the early Christians so obsessed with the martyrs? Why did they tell their stories? Why do we remember their dates? Well, I think the reason is found in a little text in the book of Revelation. Were the early Christians keen on the martyrs? Because Christianity is some kind of death cult. That we're fascinated by death. That's why we have 
crosses all over our buildings, while we focus upon the death of Jesus, we focus on the death of the martyrs. Is Christianity a death cult? Well, answer, no it isn't. The reason why the early Christian, Christians were fascinated by martyrs were because of this. This is what Revelation 12 says about the martyrs. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And remember that word testimony is the Greek word marturion, because of course witness and martyrdom are the same word in Greek, marturion. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. The reason why the early Christians were so fascinated with the martyrs, because the martyrs were the most powerful witness to Jesus Christ. They were the most powerful martyrion to Jesus because they showed that there was nothing more important than Jesus. Not even life itself was more important than Jesus. When it came to a choice, living or Jesus, they chose Jesus. And by that act, they were the greatest of all the witnesses. They witnessed to the glory, the lordship of Christ, in their deaths because they said that nothing is more important than Jesus. And so martyrdom is the normal way of Christian life and Christian discipleship precisely because witness is the normal way of Christian life. And the martyrs were the greatest witnesses. And that we as Christians should strive to be the best witnesses we possibly can, even if it leads to martyrdom. It's worth remembering the last words of Jesus. If you were to say, what were the last words of Jesus? Well, you might say, is it, fini it is finished on the cross. Well, maybe, but there's this little thing called the resurrection happened after that. Uh, you might say Matthew 28, the Great Commission, the last words of Jesus. But there's a little bit even after that in the New Testament, which is, of course, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where... Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. The last words matter, especially when you know you're about to depart. And presumably these last words that Jesus left with his disciples were pondered over, thought over. What's the one thing he wants to leave his disciples with? It is the command that they shall be witnesses. They were to be, it's as if he says to them, you know, you're not, you're not my lawyers, you're not my apologists, you're not my philosophers, you're not my literary agents, you are my witnesses. That's how important witness is as a category for thinking about our relationship with the society and the world in which we're placed. Third reason why witness really matters for us today is because this is the way the church has always grown in the past. Just think for a moment about the, the early church. Why did the early church grow from 11 frightened disciples in a room to within three, 400 years becoming the dominant religion in the Roman Empire? Well, there are a number of factors in it. One factor would be the, um, the miracle workers. Uh, many of the stories of early Christian conversion refer to the miracles that the monks and the priests and the clergy and the bishops did. Christians performed better miracles than the pagans did. When you read someone like Ramsay McMullen and his account of the early church, he kind of attributes this as the main reason why the early church grew, because of the miracles that were done. And we get figures like Gregory Thaumaturgus, Gregory the Wonder Worker. What a great name that is. Uh, I don't know if you have any wonder workers here in the Diocese of Sheffield. Maybe you do. But the miracles were one of the reasons why people came to faith. Second, second reason why people came to faith was because of the martyrs. We've spoken about those already. Uh, people could not but be impressed with people whose devotion to Jesus was so great that they were give, willing to give up their lives for him. There must be something in this if this matters so much to people. Then, of course, there were the monks. Um, the stories of these people who chose a radical path of discipleship, leaving the life of the city, to go out into the desert, to live this life of prayer and austerity and the breeding of scripture and simple manual work and the service of the poor and the development of wisdom. This deeply impressed people. When you think of St. Augustine, when he is in his garden in Milan and he hears this voice that eventually persuades him to become a Christian. What is he reading at the time? He's reading St. Athanasius's life of St. Anthony. And he is deeply convicted by 
the sacrifices that Antony made as a monk. Now, these were all part of the features of the growth of the early church, but there's a fourth factor that I want to focus on as well, and that is the work of the Christian apologists. And these were figures from the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century onwards who deliberately spoke the Christian faith to an audience outside the church. There were figures like um, Justin Martyr, who in the middle of the 2nd century um, wrote these apologies explaining what Christian faith is and what Christian worship is. A lot of people were criticizing Christians. Well, you know, Christians are people who are uh, cannibals because they, you know, they, they, they talk about eating flesh and drinking blood. Um, they, they're, 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 uh, they're all into incest because they talk about loving your brothers and sisters. And so he kind of explains what Christian worship is about, why Christians worship the, the way they do. He offers defenses for Christians who are being uh, brought up for persecution. Uh, we get figures like um, Origen uh, in the, again, third century, who uh, um, replies to this man, Celsus, who has written a long refutation of Christian faith, and point by point, uh, Origen goes through and dismantles his argument, shows how he's misunderstood Christian faith, and instead portrays a much more attractive, vibrant vision of Christian faith as he writes it. And then, of course, you get the great St. Augustine, who in his City of God, which is a very long exposition of Christian faith, basically you're saying, his argument at the heart of it is, why Christian faith offers a much better way of living and dying than paganism ever could. The paganism just does not satisfy as a way of life and as a way of approaching death, whereas Christian faith does. So the apologists were, I would argue, crucial to the growth of the early church. But there's another period we might look at as well. And that is the period of um, Britain in the 1940s. In the 1940s, uh, Britain was going through, of course, the Second World War. And during the Second World War, there was a great debate that was going on in British life and European life generally about when the war is over, what's going to rebuild civilization? Uh, what's going to take us through after this trauma of realizing that the evil of Nazism had grown up within a sophisticated, educated Christian country like Germany? What's going to rebuild our society after the devastation of the war? And right at the heart of that debate were Christian figures. People like, and you can see them up here as well, people like Dorothy Sayers, uh, writing her plays like The Man Born to be King, which was, um, uh, which was um, performed on the radio in 1941, 1942. You had C.S. Lewis giving his broadcast talks in the early 1940s, which became Mere Christianity, published in the early 1950s. You had W.H. Auden, who became a Christian in 1941 uh, because he was convinced that only the kind of the rich Christian faith of Augustine and Aquinas had the spiritual, the moral, the intellectual power to overcome and combat the evil of Nazism. You had T.S. Eliot, who back in 1922 had written The Wasteland, this, this bleak vision of culture and its future. And then after his conversion to Christianity, he writes The Four Quartets, which were written from 1936 to 1942. Again, a, a much more hopeful Christian vision of the world. You had Simone Weil, this um, mystical French um, figure who uh, never got baptized. She was always a bit nervous about the institutional church, but deeply fascinated by Jesus Christ and the way in which he called people to live. You have people like Evelyn Waugh writing Brideshead Revisited in 1945, which he always wrote uh, as a novel about the operation of divine grace on a, a group of diverse but closely connected characters. You had J.R.R. Tolkien dreaming up um, Middle Earth in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, which was published in the 1950s. You had William Temple with his po political vision of, uh, that led to the welfare state afterwards. So here are these figures in, in the early 1940s. It's probably the last time, I think, in our culture that we did this public witness really, really well. Here were these figures who were not clergy. They were not ordained. They were not theologians. They were novelists. They were poets. They were public figures. They were philosophers. They were painting a rich, imaginative picture of Christian life. Now, if you want to read more about it, you'll find it in a little book by Alan Jacobs called The Year of Our Lord, 1943, a fascinating book that gathers together these stories. But the thing that um, Jacobs doesn't recognize, which is my little theory on this, is that, that this imaginative retelling of the Christian story in public actually led to the growth of the church. When you see the figures of decline in the church in Britain from about the mid-19th century down to today, it's pretty much constant, apart from one period. And that's the end of the 1940s and the early 1950s when it goes up a little bit. 
numbers of baptisms, confirmations, people in church, the numbers go up a little bit. Now, what was that about? Is it just post-war austerity, people looking for a kind of new vision? But there had to be something about Christian faith that drew them to Christian faith as opposed to anything else at that period. And I guess my theory is that what these people did in their imaginative retelling of the Christian story, they made Christian faith believable, attractive, a real option for people. So that when that post-war austerity came, people turned towards the Christian faith as something that drew them. Some people say, well, was it Billy Graham, the early 1950s? Well, he kind of comes a little bit too early. The growth had happened before him. But what he does, I think, is he reaps the harvest of the seeds that were sown by these people. And so this was a, a moment in our time when the Christian church you know, captured the imagination of the culture. So whether the early church, whether the 1940s, the church has always grown through the imaginative public Im retelling of the Christian story, not just amongst ourselves, but in public as well. Fourthly, the reason why this really matters, because the local church needs it. Now, I'm, I was, I'm very aware as a, as a bishop of how many really good things happen at local level in our churches. I'm sure that's true in the Diocese of Sheffield as it was within the Diocese of London, um, where I served for many years. Um, but what about the voice of the church at national level? I came across a, um, a, a blog a little while ago by a um, very interesting vicar called Peter Owen Jones. You may know of him. And um, uh, he wrote this. He said, parish priests like me operate at the coalface. We baptize, we marry, we bury, we console where we can. This is the work of the Church of England at the micro level. But where the church does not have a compelling presence is at the national level, the macro level. It is here that there's been a complete lack of engagement, of witness, of imagination. Without effective national witness, work at the parish level has been made far harder. It's much harder to build the church, to grow the church, if the public narrative about Christian faith is always negative. When people think, why would I want to go to church? You spend all your time fighting with each other. It's not a very attractive vision. If all the narrative about Christian faith is negative, it's much harder to build the church at local level. And his point is that actually if the national level is, is, is the national narrative about Christian faith is positive and strong and attractive as it was back in the 1940s, it makes local parish ministry much, well, just that little bit easier. I have a, my uh, son-in-law is a um, young man who has a very strong faith and we uh, uh, one time we were walking by the River Thames where I used to live when I was Bishop of Kensington in, in, um, in Twickenham. And uh, as we walked by the river, it was a kind of winter's day and the river was flowing quite fast that day and there was, a, there was a duck in the river and it was paddling crazily to try and make some progress against the tide. And he turned to me and he said, um, you know, being a Christian sometimes feels a bit like that, that duck. The sort of tide of the culture seems to be flowing so much in the other direction that you have to paddle really hard to kind of keep going. And so many of my friends just give up paddling and get swept along with the tide. And uh, as we talked about it, and the beginnings of the idea of the Center for Culture Witness uh, were germinating in my mind, we said, well, what, what we kind of need is not so much to get the ducks to paddle harder, but to create some currents in the tide that make it just that little bit easier to flow and to swim in the right direction. So there are my four reasons why witness matters. And so that's my thesis for today. The primary posture of the church towards the world is not that we are here to transform the world. We're not here to mount arguments as to why people should believe in God. Uh, we're not here just to withdraw into ourselves. We're not here just to build big churches, but our primary task is to bear witness to Jesus and his kingdom. To point, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what the church is always called to do, to bear witness. And the results of that witness is really out of our hands. Sometimes the church bears witness and it leads to a, an increased place within society. That's what happened in Christendom. The emperors realized that the Christian church was a powerful force for good and welcomed the Christian church to shape a culture. That may happen again. It may be that the church finds a greater place within culture. It may be that it leads to the growth of the church. We find our churches packed out with people wanting to come and worship and be part of the life of the church. That may happen. It may equally happen that we all get 
cancelled and persecuted, and maybe even killed for our faith. That is not our business. What happens is in the hands of God. Our business is to bear witness to Jesus Christ. Okay, so in the first half, we've been thinking about um, why witness is the right posture of the church towards the world. Our task is to point to Jesus Christ, the one who takes away the sin of the world, um, and leave the result of that to God. Uh, but I want to go on to ask what kind of witness is needed. And I've got four things I want to say here. Um, you can tell I'm a preacher at heart because all the points begin with the same letter. Um, once a preacher, always a preacher. So uh, first thing, first aspect of public witness I think we need is what I call a... Um, oh, well, sorry, before we do that. Um, this is a text that I, I keep on going back to and thinking about the nature of, of witness. This text from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I just, I'd read it. You'll, you'll know it very well, but just to remind you of it. Um, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show... Sorry? Oh, you can't hear. Sorry. Okay. Try this one. Um, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Can you hear that right? Okay, good. Um, to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So out of that, the first type of witness I think we need is what I call confessional witness. Now, we use that word confess in two different ways in the Christian church. We talk about confessing Christ. We have figures like Edward the Confessor. They were confessors of Jesus Christ. So we confess our faith in Jesus Christ. So it's a witness that is unembarrassed, unashamed, confessional, in that we confess the name of Christ in public. We're not embarrassed about being Christians. We are open about our commitment to Jesus Christ. But we also talk about confession in the sense that we confess our sins, we confess our sins. And what I want to suggest is that these two are closely related in the witness that we bear. Our confession of Christ and our confession of sins are somehow linked together. Of course, of course, the context in which we bear witness is that we are not the only witnesses. There are many people bearing witness to something. Public witness is very crowded space. Every newspaper you open, every website you look at, every advert you listen to, every video, is some kind of celebrity bearing witness to something. And they're saying, if you drive this car, if you use this shampoo, if you use this face cream, if you eat this food, you will be healthy, well, and everything else. But a lot of current social witness, particularly within social media, is quite self-focused. If you want to become a uh, an influencer today, you basically have to display your life online. You go around with a video camera, taking pictures of yourself, eating breakfast, and going around your day, and you post it up online, and you, 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 you're going to encourage people to follow you, to become your followers, and you amass a following to yourself. There's a kind of self-referential element to public witness today. Um, and sometimes the church can do this too. Uh, I was in Rome just before Christmas, and uh, whenever I passed a, a, um, 
and news agents, I saw this. Uh, it is the hot priest calendar. And uh, every month you open it up and there's a picture of another sort of smoldering, tanned um, Catholic priest. And, uh, and I saw this, I kind of thought, well, well you know, why, why did they do this? Why did they produce this thing? You know, it can't quite be that, you know, well, you know, if you play your cards right, you could bag one of these hunks for yourself, because Catholic priests are slightly off limits when it comes to that. Um, you know, is it something for the convent wall, you know, for the, the nuns to <laughs> look at that day? Um, but then I thought, well, I think I, know, I think I know what it's about. This is about saying, well, you know, if you become a Catholic, if you become a Christian, you could be cool too. Because the church is a place for cool people. It's for good-looking people. It's shiny. It's attractive. It's great. And this is, if you like, the church echoing that kind of self-referential type of public witness that tries to display a shiny picture of what we are like. Say, so, you know, if you, and you, know, you can see it on church websites as well, we like to put pictures of young, smiling, good-looking people and say, well, if you could join our wonderful club. But the problem, of course, of that is that we know the reality of the church isn't like that. Um, I hate to disillusion you, but most priests in the Church of England, let alone the Catholic Church, don't quite look like this. And you all look wonderful, by the way. You know, I'm sure you're much more handsome than these people and good-looking and everything else, but we kind of know it's not like that. And it's sometimes even worse than that, because, of course, we know that our church is not very attractive a lot of the time. We are riven with disagreement. Uh, we're not very good at safeguarding. We're not very good at keeping care of people who are vulnerable in our communities. So we think, well, how do we bear witness when our church is so frail and fallen? And if we're honest about ourselves, we might ask that same question. How can I bear witness when my life is such a mess and doesn't speak well of the glory of Jesus? And, but of course, this type of witness, which is saying... Um, uh, you know, look at the church. You could be like this if you became a Christian. That kind of witness doesn't fit well with a Christian understanding of how witness works. Think of John the Baptist for a moment. His great theme was, I must decrease, he must increase. That doesn't fit well with a kind of social influencer mode where you're basically drawing attention to yourself and gaining followers for yourself. So how does this work? Now, I think perhaps the key to it is in um, these texts from our reading in 2 Corinthians 4. This reading it says, We do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Uh, there's a German theologian called um, Helmut Thielicke, uh, who was a, um, a quite important figure in the Second World War. Second World War during, in, in Germany. He was an opponent of the Nazi regime. He somehow survived and was, again, an important figure in the rebuilding of the German church after the Second World War. And he once uh, preached a sermon, um, which I remember reading a number of years ago, which really struck me. It was a sermon on 2 Corinthians 3, that passage that talks about um, uh, that we are uh, letters from Christ, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on stone, but human hearts. And he asked the question, are we adverts for God or letters from him? Are we adverts for God or letters from him? Am I an advert for God that says, if you become a Christian, you can be like me? Now, the minute you say that, you kind of realize it can't quite work that way. None of us would really want to say that at all. And his point was that we are not adverts for God, but we are letters from him. And the letter says something like this, that here is a weak, ordinary, failing person, and yet somehow, despite their failures, their sins, their frailty, God loves them and redeems them. Christ died for them. They are made gloriously and preciously in the image of God. And now and again, that makes a real difference in their life. We know the church is not a great advert for God. But then again, maybe it was never meant to be. 
Our Lord is struck by us. And Paul says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Not I was the worst, but I am the worst. So the true Christian witness does not say, I used to be a chronic worrier, but now I believe in Jesus, I don't worry anymore. It doesn't say, I used to struggle with lust, but now the Holy Spirit's come into my life, it's no longer a problem. It doesn't say, I used to have a hot temper, but now I don't any longer because I'm a Christian. True witness says something different. It says, yeah, I struggle with anxiety. I always have, but in that anxiety, Christ somehow gives me peace. Yes, I'm manic, I'm too busy, I do too much. But somehow the presence of Christ slows me down. Yes, I'm lazy, I sit around and I don't do very much. But I find in Jesus Christ that he gives me purpose. See the difference? This is confessional witness, where you confess Christ at the same time as confessing our own weakness and frailty and sin. Tilika puts it like this, I can be a credible letter from God only when I do not try to cover up my own weakness or try to make myself to be more than I am. I can be a credible letter only when I do not hide my deficiencies and reluctance, my weaknesses as an earthen vessel, my own smallness of faith. By my admission of this, I truly praise the goodness of the God who does not let me go. But somehow in the strange dynamic of Christian witness, Witness is not invalidated by the weakness and frailty of the person or the community witnessing. In fact, in some ways, it's enhanced and made clearer because we do not proclaim ourselves, but we proclaim Christ as Lord. Now, of course, we don't deliberately go out to fail. We have to be judicious about the ways we share our inner lives and struggles and sins, but the dynamic of witness is to point not towards ourselves, but away from ourselves in Christ. And it says when we do point to ourselves, it's to point up both our own struggles and failures, but also the work of Christ in us. And so this one point about confessional witness points us to the importance within witness of telling the story of Christ in you. Not just the story of Christ, not just the story of you, but the story of Christ in you. What difference does it make to you to be a Christian? What difference does it make to your community to have a church in the heart of it? Being honest about our struggles, but also honest about the difference that Christ makes. So there's the first type of witness, confessional witness. Second type is what I call a critical witness. Again, our text said this, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And what St. Paul seems to suggest here is that unbelief is not purely a, an intellectual, rational business. There is something as a kind of spiritual dynamic that goes on it. That the God of this age, the spirit of this age, somehow blinds the minds of many so they cannot see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, we, we as those who are believers in Christ, when we see the face of Jesus Christ, we see not just a human face, but we see the glory of God in that face. Other people look at that face and do not see the glory of God. They see just another historical figure. They do not see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it's because of the God of this age, if you like, the spirit of this age, you might say. There's a, an old story of um, uh, an old goldfish swimming along in a pond, and he... Um, passes by two young goldfish swimming in the other direction. And as the old goldfish passes the two younger ones, he says, um, well, how are you finding the water today, boys? And one of the younger goldfish says to the other one, what's he talking about? What's water? Point being, of course, if you're a goldfish, you don't know that you're swimming in water. You're not aware that there's this thing called water that surrounds you all the time. It's just the element in which you move. And that's true, if you like, of culture, the culture in which we live, the things we just assume. One of definition of culture it is to say it's the stuff we take for granted. And there's all kinds of things we share with those around us of all faiths and none, stuff we take for granted. 
Every age has its gods. Every culture has its sacred things, those things you cannot question. Every culture is religious. That divide between the secular and the religious doesn't really work when you dig into it. So take an example, we sometimes talk about faith schools, as if there are these things called faith schools, which are normally thought of as you know, maybe Islamic or Christian, and then there are non-faith schools, which are normally secular. But actually, when you think about it, that definition really doesn't work at all, that distinction, because every school is a faith school. Every school believes in something, and you can tell that by looking at every school website. Because every school has some kind of statement like, we believe in our pupils. We believe in the potential of our students. We believe in equal opportunity. We believe in the power of science. We believe in getting good exam results. We believe in our staff. We believe in our facilities. There are things that every school believes in. Every school is a faith school. Now, if that's true, then our culture is religious every bit as much as the first century culture into which Christianity was born. And maybe the gods of that culture were fairly obvious because you had temples on every street corner to Aphrodite or to Apollo or to Mercury or the different Greek gods or Roman gods. Maybe our gods are a little less obvious than that. But a crucial task of witness is to identify the gods of the particular culture in which you are placed. What are the things of ultimate value? The things that people would sacrifice most for. That's how you tell what a person really worships. When you ask the question, what would you sacrifice most for? Worship and sacrifice have always been close together. We sacrifice for the things that matter to us. And so when you're asking about your local community, or a more broader community of British society, or European, or world, or whatever, Western society, whatever it might be, ask the question, what are the things of ultimate value? What would people sacrifice most for? Their family, their holidays, time off at the weekend, bank balance, the caravan. What is it that people would sacrifice most for? Some of you will know the uh, work of James K.A. Smith, an American academic who uh, writes about what he calls cultural liturgies, where he writes about how every institution has a set of sacred things and a set of liturgies that encourage us to, if you like, to worship those sacred things. They have a story that they tell. And he invites us to look at culture through the lens of worship. He asks the question, what is my culture wanting me to give my heart to? So he has an example of, uh, of a university. A university has a culture, a set of values that people are, are encouraged to kind of um, to, 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 to recognize. He talks about shopping malls, shopping centers, and talks about the, uh, the cultural liturgies of shopping centers. Um, so one of the statements of the cultural liturgy of a shopping mall, he says, is, I'm broken, therefore I shop. That when you go into the shopping mall, you become aware of the difference between yourself and the figures in the, screen, in, the, in the shop window who stare at you, all the kind of good-looking people wearing their clothes. And the message is, if you buy these clothes, you will become like them. You will be shiny and happy like they are. There's another message that says, don't ask, don't tell. Keep the, the, uh, the processes of production hidden. So you don't ask the question of what happens to all the stuff that gets thrown away because you're buying new stuff. Don't ask the question of where these things came from and where and who are the people who put them together that enable you to buy cheap clothes in Marks and Spencer's or wherever it might be. And so he encourages us to ask questions like this. We should be asking, what vision of human flourishing is implicit in this or that practice? What does the good life look like as embedded in cultural rituals? What sort of person will I become after being immersed in this or that cultural liturgy? He goes on to say, um, it is precisely when your ultimate conviction is that there is no eternal that you're most prone to absolutize the temporal. When you say there is no God, there is no transcendent, there's nothing beyond this world, <coughs> that's the moment when you're most likely to give ultimate value to something that is temporal <coughs> and passing in time. <coughs> so, identifying the gods, the idols of a culture, is a crucial discipline in bearing witness. 
Um, <coughs> this is something, again, that the early church did very well. Adolf von Harnack, one of the great um, historians of the early church, wrote this. The duty of keeping oneself free from all contamination with polytheism ranked as the supreme duty of the Christian. Exclusiveness was the condition of her existence as a church. If she made terms with polytheism at a single point, it was all over with her distinctive character. What the early church learned to do was to recognize the gods of their culture and to offer a different form of worship. And so, if we are going to exercise <coughs> public witness, we need to understand the story our culture tells, learn to read culture, especially perhaps for those of us who are called to teach within the church. It's a crucial theological and prophetic task. And it's why the task of witness has an inevitably contemplative element to it. Because witness needs that kind of withdrawal, that withdrawal from, with a little bit of distance. You can never get entire difference from your culture because you're always swimming in it. It's the water we swim in. But contemplation, withdrawing into the realm of the spirit, where we are asking the Spirit to draw us close to the presence of Christ and to see our culture for what it is, those things that are good, those things that are not so good in the culture that we're part of. That's a crucial element of witness. So it's significant that after the martyrs, the most effective witnesses were the monks offering this withdrawal, this alternative way of life as a kind of critique of the culture they were living in. So there, and here are some questions that you might... <coughs> Want to ask about um, culture. <coughs> when you ask about uh, culture in your local town, city, village, will you ask about more general culture in our country? What, what does it want me to become? What are the objects of ultimate value? What is its vision of a successful human life? How is it shaping me and others? We are very malleable, plastic beings as humans. We are always being formed or shaped by something. When you go to theological college, there's a lot of talk about formation. We talk about it all the time. Sometimes as if that's the only place formation happens. But of course, formation is happening all the time. Every single thing that you listen to or you watch or you read is shaping and forming you in some way. Our culture is always shaping you. So being just that little bit contemplative, critical distance from the culture enables us to identify the gods of the age and to say, well, what it means, to recognize what it means to worship Jesus Christ above all. Third aspect of witness is what I call creative witness. This is our text towards the end of 2 Corinthians 4, where it says, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And what St. Paul does there, and of course it's picked up in the, in the Nicene Creed when uh, we, we talk about God who the maker of all things, seen and unseen, that language. St. Paul turns around our normal expectation. We, we normally think, of course, of the seen things as the, as the things we can rely on. Those things we can see and touch and feel and measure, they're the solid things. They're the things we know about. The unseen things, the things we can't see, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, ascension, atonement, resurrection, miracles, angels, demons, evil, good, those unseen things, they're a bit unsubstantial. We can't really be sure of them. And so we focus on the seen things. And St. Paul turns that the other way around. He says, actually, it's the seen things that are temporal. <clears throat> they will one day pass away. It's the eternal things, it's the unseen things that are eternal. And witness is all about opening people's eyes to the unseen as well as the seen. Some of you will know the work of um, Charles Taylor, the uh, Canadian um, uh, philosopher, um, uh, Roman Catholic um, philosopher. He, he, he wrote probably the the great book on secularism, A Secular Age, uh, in which he talks about um, what he calls the imminent frame. <clears throat> and the, the idea of this is if you imagine a, if you imagine a picture <clears throat> with a frame, and inside the frame are the seen things, the things you can see and touch and feel and, and measure. Um, 
And if you like, there's a frame around it. And we all operate with this. Again, whether we're religious or not religious, we all operate with this idea that there are seen things that we can measure. That's kind of the way which the modern world works. But then there may or may not be, he says, all these unseen things outside the frame. Now, those of us who are religious, who have a belief in God, we believe there are unseen things outside the frame. And every now and again, there are cracks in the frame that enable us to see beyond the seen to the unseen. There are people who just think there is nothing beyond the frame. There's nothing transcendent, there's just the imminent. But we all operate with this idea of a frame around the seen things and the unseen things. The difference is whether we think there's anything beyond the frame of the seen. Now, our task, I suggest, as witnesses, is to open the eyes of people to the unseen world, helping them to see a world that is bigger and richer and more colorful than they ever possibly imagined. It is to live a life and to speak in an unashamed and unembarrassed way that includes the seen and the unseen. Um, it's a little bit like um, going to the cinema in one of those 3D films where you go and if you look at it just with your sort of naked eye, it's all a bit of a blur, but you get given these glasses and you put them on and suddenly you can see an extra dimension in the film that you couldn't see before. But suddenly putting on these glasses suddenly opens out a whole new world that is part of, but un invisible beforehand. And I've been trying to get into this discipline a little bit myself recently. Of uh, when, I, when I do my morning prayers, when I um, uh, say morning prayer in the morning, it's a, it's a bit like I'm, I'm, I'm putting on a pair of spectacles to enable me to, as I go through the day, to see the unseen as well as the seen realities. So that when I see a person who comes in my direction, I don't just say to myself, well, there's another person a man, a woman, whatever it might be. But I say and said, here is something precious, someone precious, who is made by God, designed by him in his secret purposes, for whom Christ died. Someone who has the potential to be filled with God's Holy Spirit and to live forever in the presence of Christ. It's like C.S. Lewis's thing, you have never met an ordinary mortal. That's the unseen reality that goes beyond the seen. That when I go out into the world and I see nature around me, I don't just see nature, I see creation. I see something that is given to me as a gift. So when I go out and I see a tree, it is not just a bit of organic matter that happened to fall into the ground and grow into this little thing. It's a gift from God to me at that moment as I observe it. It's something that gives life by its very being there. It gives beauty and meaning. Even when I pay my taxes, I'm not just paying taxes because I have to, but because I am contributing as an act of love to people around me by enabling a well-functioning civic life, because that is the way God intended us to live together, not on our own. You see the point? Opening your eyes to the unseen realities and therefore, what we are seeking to do in bearing witness is opening the eyes of other people to see the unseen as well as the seen. Um, now, this is something, uh, just a little detour for the moment, <laughs> the Center for Cultural Witness, which is um, um, the new venture that I'm uh, involved in in, uh, in this sort of season of life is something that's trying to do this very thing. One of the main things that we uh, produce is a website called um, Seen and Unseen. There's the title. Um, and um, uh, what it is, is trying to, you can see there's a little slogan on the top left there, you can't see it very well on the screen, but it says, Christian Perspectives on Just About Everything. And what it's trying to do is to, well, we, we run new articles every day. Um, there's new, something new coming out all the time. Um, trying to comment on wider cultural questions, issues that are in the news at the moment, whatever everybody's talking about, but try to see it in the light of the unseen, not just the seen. So just on this little snapshot there, there's an article on um, the gospel of self-belief. You know when celebrities say, I, you know, I believe in myself. It's there in Ted Lasso, it's there in Taylor Swift, you can find it, you know, how, how do you, is that, is that right? Is that, a, is that, a, is that good, good news? Is that gospel? 
There's an article there about um, peacekeeping in uh, a kind of Christian peacekeeper who's been involved very much within the of Israel Gaza a situation and experience of what Christian faith brings to the task of peacekeeping. There's an article there about algorithms, how the algorithm that feeds you the stuff that you get on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or whatever actually is a bit of a mirror to your soul. Um, here's another one, a uh, more recent one. There's an uh, article there on... Um, on the meaning of Lent, there's something there on uh, the post office scandal. What do we make of the fact that at the heart of the post office scandal is a priest? Now, how do we understand that? Um, and then the thing about ADHD. So the point is, you know, um, and the point of the, the um, website is that everything is written for the person outside the church. Uh, it is not the Church Times. It's not Christianity magazine. It's not written for a Christian audience. It's written for the people outside the church. And the idea being that it's something that um, you could take and you could quite happily pass on to other people who maybe don't share your faith, don't see the unseen. And they might just open their eyes to that very thing. I have a group of, um, group of men that I used to play football with many years ago. We're now too old to play football. Um, so we have coffee instead. And uh, we meet on a Friday morning in a local kind of cafe and we chat and um, um, there's one other who has a faith, but everyone else is, is not um, part of the church. And um, we will talk about everything. We'll talk about Donald Trump or the election, or we'll talk about um, in the cost of living crisis, or we'll talk about the Israel-Gaza war. We'll talk about all the stuff that everyone talks about. Now, there are a group of people that I, I could not send them something to read about the doctrine of the Trinity or the incarnation or the atonement, because why would they want to read that? But very often after our conversation, I'll just ping them on our little WhatsApp group, an article that we run on the site, and say, well, here's something we published recently on Israel Gaza, uh, or something on, um, on um, you know, the, 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 the row between the government and the church on asylum seekers, just to give you a little perspective on it. And so often I get the response back, that's really interesting. Never thought of it that way before. Just a simple way of opening people's eyes to the unseen realities. Um, you were told earlier on not to fiddle with your phones, but you are allowed to fiddle with your phones for a moment. If you want to kind of go onto the website, you can um, just point your phone at that QR code and get onto it there. Just as a, a if you like, something that both helps us as those of, with faith to open our eyes to see how everything looks when you see it in the light of Jesus Christ, but also uh, something we can use in our witness to other people uh, as well. Um, one of the ways we think about this is um, that language of 2 Corinthians 4 about how God has um, caused the light of the glory of God to shine in the face of Jesus Christ. Part of our task as witnesses is to describe a world that is lit up by the, glory of, by the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What does that world look like? What does law and economics and politics and government, what does everything look like when it's viewed as a world in which God has become incarnate? in which the resurrection happened, in which death is not the final word. What does this world look like when it's lit up by the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ? Well, the last thing about um, witness is that true witness is always costly. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. We spoke about the martyrs earlier on. People tend to take notice when someone sacrifices something of infinite precious value for the sake of something else. When we think of the growth of the early church, it's no accident that it was the church of the martyrs that convinced and converted a whole culture. And it's generally true that a witness that costs little will probably achieve little. And therefore, witness that we bear has to have some element of cost to it. That, if you like, you put it this way. There has to be something in your life, in my life, in the life of your local church that is inexplicable apart from faith in Jesus. That makes people think, why would they do that? I just cannot understand it. Because once that question gets lodged in someone's mind, it begins to nag away at them. And it leads to something much deeper. As that text in 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. 
it assumes that someone has asked you the question, why do you have this hope? So what, we do, what happens when we bear witness? And the dynamic of this is, as Paul puts it, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus. So that as we do that, the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. That somehow in the miracle of grace, this kind of witness, this witness that is confessional, honest about ourselves, our weakness, as well as the life of Christ in us, this witness that is critical, that is willing to stand back and observe and identify the gods of the age, this witness that is creative, that opens people's eyes to the unseen, and this witness that is costly. Somehow when we give that witness, the life of Jesus is revealed in our body, and somehow people are enabled to encounter and experience the love of God in Jesus Christ.